You're listening to Tim Bolkley's Five Minute Bible. Humor in the Bible, Book Fifteen, Ezra. Ezra is neither my favorite nor the funniest book in the Bible, for sure. And much of what's touted as humor in the book is of the sort where readers are not sure if it's intended, or in the eye of the beholder. Other humor is of the you either have to laugh or cry type. Like the early climax scene, when after all the people have been named, even the ones whose claim to be priests was disqualified, perhaps because they had taken their great great many great grandmother's name, and we've been impressed by the sheer numbers of people, gold and silver, the temples in use and the foundations laid. Ezra 3, verses 12 to 13. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. Yep. When the temple is beginning to be rebuilt, you either have to laugh or cry. And then there's something strange going on with language in Ezra. It's not only the bits that claim to be citing imperial decrees that are written in Aramaic, but no one has really ever explained why the other bits are also, in a book that's encased in Hebrew. And there's clearly an interest in languages and translation in the text of the book. So in 4.7, in the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Mithridath and Tabiel, and the rest of their associates wrote to King Artaxerxes of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. And then when the letters received, verse 18, the letter that you sent us has been read in translation before me. I don't know what's going on here. Maybe there's some humor. Another candidate for humor is the tactful representation of Ezra's lack of faith. In chapter 8, where they're about to set out on the great journey back to Jerusalem, and interestingly in the book called by his name Ezra really only appears in the second half then I proclaimed a fast there by the river Ahava that we might deny ourselves before our God and seek from him a safe journey for ourselves our children and all our possessions for I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and cavalry to protect us against the enemy on our way since we had told the king that the hand of our God is gracious to all who seek him but his power and his wrath are against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. Though somehow this chink in Ezra's armour, Faith, is less funny and more sombre, because of his former zeal, and even worse later, brutality in enforcing racial purity. David's candidate for humour in Ezra is the more conventional, make fun of the authorities kind, which is so common in Scripture. Back in Ezra chapter 4, the governor of the Beyond the River province, roughly the Levant, south and west of the river Euphrates, has opposed the building work and sent to the emperor for support, claiming Jerusalem to be a rebellious city since forever. They get backed up and the work stops. However, in chapter 5, Haggai and Zechariah get work restarted on the temple. 5.3. At the same time, Tatnai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bosnai and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure and he takes their names just like a prefect at school sending a report to the Emperor asking for instructions David assumes that this is with the intent of stopping work again that's quite likely though not all commentators see it that way which is why I've hesitated to make it the example of humor in Ezra however the instruction comes back that not only is work to continue, but that imperial taxes that they collect are to contribute, with a horrendous punishment for disobedience. Verses 8 to 13. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these people in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province beyond the river. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests in Jerusalem require, let that be given to them day by day without fail, so that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and his children. Furthermore, 
I decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of the house of the perpetrator, who shall be impaled on it. The house shall be made a dunghill. May the God who has established his name there overthrow any king or people that shall put forth a hand to alter this, or to destroy this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make the decree, let it be done with all diligence. Then, according to the word sent by King Darius, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bosnai and their associates did with all diligence what King Darius had ordered. And, as David says, I'm sure they did. So, there's not much humour in Ezra, but perhaps there are some sparks. 